It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. And it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. And it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. And it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. And we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven and we're all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on it being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of compassion only. Should I continue reading the book? (laughs) Those of you that know it, right? It's the tale of two cities. I had to because the sermon titled this morning is A Tale of Two Mountains, right? So it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. This story this morning is an interesting story. It's like stuck in the middle of it's stuck out here in the middle for us. Like and it makes absolutely no sense, right? Jesus takes Peter, James and John six days later, goes up a mountain And there before Peter, James and John, Jesus is transfigured and they see Moses and Elijah standing there. And then a cloud comes down and God speaks. It just makes no sense. There's a lot of things in this story that we don't understand. But here's a little bit that we can get from this. Is this story, a couple questions here in the beginning that I'm not going to answer until we get to the end. Is this story about Peter, James and John? Is it about us or is it about Jesus? Who's changed in the story? So we have this story, right, of this mountain experience. Jesus takes Peter, James and John's John, not John's John, singular, the three of them. He takes them up the mountain and it says six days later, Jesus did this six days later than what? What just happened six days ago? No. That was back in chapter 5. This is now chapter 17. This is a long time removed from where we were a couple days ago, last week. So, what just happened six days ago? Or is the six days supposed to make us look back to Mount Sinai? Because remember our text, the Old Testament reading, right? It says that the cloud of fire was on the mountain for six days. And on the seventh day, God called Moses to come up. It's not actually. If you look back at chapter 16, which I hope all of you will later. Chapter 16 in the Gospel of Matthew says that six days ago that Jesus and his disciples were in Caesarea Philippi. Which is the the seat of the Greek god Pan. um, Which is a very interesting god. You should Google it. Only if you're over the age of 18. And if you're under 18, do it with your parents. Pan is an interesting God. And Jesus and his disciples were here. And Jesus, this is the first time that Jesus tells them, bless you, in the Gospel of Matthew, what's going to happen. He says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be put on trial. I'm going to be beaten. And and I'm going to be put to death. But before he does that, Jesus asks the disciples, he says, you know, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say you are. Who was on the mountain with Jesus? No, the other one? Elijah. Some say you are Elijah. And some say you are one of the prophets. And Jesus turned to them and he said, who, and who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, Peter, this was not told to you by any man, but by God above. And he praised him for it. And then Jesus said, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be put on trial. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be killed. And Peter says, not as long as I'm a part of this group. It's not going to happen that way. And Jesus says to Peter. No. Opiso mu santana in the Greek, which is get behind me, Satan. Jesus went in five minutes of time from praising Peter for his confession of who Jesus was to calling him Satan. And now, six days later, he takes Peter with him up the mountain to allow Peter to see him with James and John 
to not let the three of them see Jesus with Moses and Elijah. And I want to know, how did Peter, James, and John know that it was Moses and Elijah? Were they wearing name tags? Hello, my name is Moses. I mean, it's not like they saw pictures of Moses and Elijah so they could compare them to them. It's not like they, you know, had posters of them in their room of heroes, the Old Testament heroes, right? It didn't happen that way. They look, but they knew who they were. And Jesus was transfigured, transformed. Who did the transforming? Did Jesus do it? God did it. Jesus didn't do it. It was done to him. Jesus was transfigured before them. He was changed by God. See, that's the key to this story. And the other key to this story, the tale of the two mountains, right? At the beginning and end of Lent, we have two mountains. We have a mountain here at Jesus' transfiguration where he takes Peter, James, and John and he goes up to the mountain and he meets with Moses and Elijah. And at the end of Lent, we also have a mountain where Jesus is taken up and nailed to a cross and hung up between two thieves. There's a lot of similarity between these two mountains, though. You see, in this first story here, this is the Jesus we want, the Jesus that shines, the Jesus that is perfect, the Jesus that is made to be in the image of God so that we can see His glory. And on the mountain on the other end of Lent is the Jesus that we need. The Jesus that loves us enough to go and suffer death on a cross for each and every one of us. And on this first mountain we see the cloud come down and God's voice comes out and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. And on the second mountain, we also have a proclamation of who Jesus is. Nailed to the cross above him. Here is the king of the Jews. Bless you. In both mountains, on the first one, we have Elijah there with Moses speaking with Jesus. On the second mountain where Jesus is hanging on the cross, which we'll get on Good Friday, we see Jesus cry out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And the people standing there say, look, he's calling for Elijah to come and save him. And not only do we have God proclaiming who Jesus is on the first mountain, but we have the centurion proclaiming on the second mountain, truly this man was the son of God. You see, you can't have this first mountain without having that second mountain. And without that second mountain, this first mountain doesn't make any difference. You see, it's all about how much God loves each and every one of us that He's willing to take these three, one of whom just screwed up royally six days ago, trying to get in the way of the plan. But still God, Jesus, loved him enough to say, you need to come and see this. You need to come and be a part of this. Because it's not about what's going to happen to me. It's about what's happening to you. Right here. And right now. Because you see, if you look at that, Jesus was changed. Just the way that God has changed and is changing each and every one of us. You see, we're afraid to live our lives in the way that God has called us to live them. But that's not what God has called us to. He doesn't give us... A spirit of fear, but he gives us a spirit of power. And if we look closely at what those three things were that God said on that first mountain. Right? The cloud came down and God said, this is my son. Listen to him. What is Jesus telling us? What Jesus tells the the disciples then, right? Because they fall down in fear and Jesus walks up to them after everything's done and gone. And he says, get up. And do not be afraid. Here's the interesting part to that though. Get up. Right? It sounds like he's telling them they need to get up. It'd be like me telling the choir, get up. And they have to stand up, right? All on their own fruition, all by their own doing. That's not what that says though. That verb there for 
the word there in the Greek is actually a second plural passive imperative. Second means not first or third, meaning not I or he, she, or it, but meaning second is you. Plural, meaning y'all, right? All of you. He's talking to the three of them. You, he's talking to all of us. Passive. Who does the action? Do the people that are getting up do the action? Or does somebody else do the action to them? Somebody else does it to them. Jesus is saying, be raised up. And don't be afraid. You're not going to do it yourself. But God's going to do it for you. God is there to raise you up. God is there to bring you to new life. God is there to fill you with a life and send you out into the world. Because you're supposed to listen to Jesus. Have Him lift you up. And then don't live your life in fear. I heard a song yesterday while I was driving many, many miles. Um... By Hawk Nelson. It's called Live Like You Are Love. And the second verse is, And live like you know you're valuable, like you know the one that holds your soul, cause mercy has called you by your name. Don't be afraid to live in that grace. Live like you know you're valuable, like you know the one that holds your soul, cause mercy has called you by your name. Don't be afraid to live in that grace. So go ahead and live like your love. It's okay to act like you've been set free. His love has made you more than enough. So go ahead and be who he made you to be. Right? I skipped over the verse that I had in here for Clyde, though. I'll tell you something, this God we believe in. Yeah, he changed everything. No more guilt, no more shame. He took all that away and gave us a reason to sing. We don't have to live in fear because God has already named us and claimed us. He took Peter, James and John and he would take each and every one of you up that mountain because each and every one of us, just like Peter, gets it and we don't. And we're going to say it and we're going to mess it up. But Jesus is still going to be there to lift you up and take you up that mountain and allow you to see Moses and Elijah with him to let you see him in all of his glory, to let you understand just how much he loves you. And he's going to lift you up and send you out into the world because that's actually the third mountain. I said this is a tale of two mountains. It's actually three. Why confirmation students? Because if you ask, if I ask for a numerical answer, what's one of them? Three. Three is always a good answer in the Bible. There's three mountains here. There's the transfiguration. There's Jesus' death on Golgotha. And then there's the mountain where Jesus meets with the disciples and they worship him and they doubt. And Jesus says to all of them, go into every nation, teaching them about me, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, making disciples everywhere you go. Because Jesus loves us enough that he's not going to leave us where we were. He's going to lift us up and show us his glory. He's going to go to the cross and die for each and every one of us. And then he's going to meet us on that third mountain and say, this isn't the place you have to stay. You need to go into all the world because that's why I love you. I've loved you enough as my own creation so that you can go and share that love with everyone else. So live like you're loved. And walk like you're free. And stand like you know who He made you to be. Live like you're loved, like you believe. His love is all that you'll ever need. So live like you're loved. And show that love to all of the world.